So, welcome, Team UB from the UK. Consultant pediatrician, the CEO at uh, the Children's E Hospital. That's yeah. something fantastic. Yeah. And you were, were also very much involved in uh, producing the first national guide guidelines for PANS uh, treatment in the UK, didn't you? Yes. yes. And I think you were also involved. Uh, I not only think I know you were involved in uh, in uh, taking care of the old migrants. In Greece, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. It was a project um, a few years ago where we uh, went out with the hospital uh, using online technology to support the children who were coming across the Syrian refugees and trying to provide the specialist paediatric support for them. Uh, right. We've got an ongoing project, hopefully, to do that with uh, in, in other disaster zones. Okay, yeah. that's yeah. great. And uh, I wanted to ask you about Brexit as well, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm about, I think I'm off topic. Uh, let's hear about your development okay. of the Panda service, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, the thing about this uh, lecture is that it's what you call the graveyard shift. Okay, so it's the last lecture of the day and uh, somehow I've got to wake you up and I've got to talk to you about things that you're going to be interested in. Hopefully you'll enjoy what I have to say. But the thing that I've got to do is, first of all, get you stimulated. So how do I do that? Well, let's uh, talk about Viagra, yeah? So, does anyone know, and there's, there's method in my madness here, does anybody know how Viagra was discovered? Yeah? So, go and tell me. Yeah, it's a side effect of a drug. So, uh, Viagra was initially developed as a uh, cardiovascular drug. And uh, on the rounds, when they were doing the phase two studies, which was studied in men, so the six men who were uh, subjected to uh, Viagra as a, uh, as a test agent, um, on, the, on the ward rounds, uh, the, the morning after they'd taken this pill, um, the, they were looking at cardiovascular status, they looking at blood pressure, heart rate, and um, at the back of this group of people that were going around was a, a young a doctor who noticed that everybody there had an erection. <laughs> so he went off to his boss after they finished the round, nobody else had, uh, thought about this, he went off and uh, this was with Pfizer and told them about his idea that we could use this for impotence. And he got a bonus of £30,000 <laughs> <laughs> for a drug which is now multi, a multi billion pound drug. So, so there's something about when we have a drug, the side effects of the drug are sometimes the effects that we actually wanted to achieve. But it's that context and it's about thinking about what we take in drugs and the drugs that we give our children and the impact that those could have. And sometimes when we have a drug, we probably don't know this, but we're actually also utilising some of its side effects for our own benefit. So this is something I want to talk about later. So I'm going to talk about the, um, the UK experience for panels and pants, um, and hopefully um, try and transmit some information over to you so that we can continue this movement and this growth that we've seen, which was started in the States, um, and hopefully build on the treatment protocols that are currently available so that our ultimate aim is to make sure that the children that we treat get the best care possible, okay, irrespective of where they come from. Um, and I've got to say thank you, first of all, to all the parents that I've met over the last couple of days who have taught me so much. Parents specifically, because it's your stories and the journey that you've been through and the sacrifice that you've had to make that I think has, has uh, given the energy for these types of conferences. So as a disclosure, uh, as, 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 I was, as you uh, were told, I'm an NHS consultant uh, working in the United Kingdom and I'm also CEO and clinical director of the Children's E Hospital which is a virtual paediatric service and um, that's, you know, if you're talking to me about that offline then I'm happy to have a chat with you. But today I'm going to focus on uh, pandas and pans. And we're going, to take, go, we're going to go back in time because we've already heard about, about symptoms and how Thomas Sidman uh, described uh, St. Vitus dance back in the 1600s. But several hundred years later, um, Sir William Osler, who was actually a Canadian physician, 
um, try to make um, some comments regarding the neuropsychiatric symptoms he started to see in children who were diagnosed with rheumatic fever. And he came out with some very interesting uh, statements. And this is in Old English, so he said he describes disturbances of the moral sense uh, manifested frequently in a strange perverseness with great ir irritability of temper and emotional outbreaks. Okay. And then he goes on and says, a frequent complaint heard from the mother is that the character of the child is completely changed. This was 125 years ago. It's amazing, isn't it? And it, he goes on, the child demonstrates what, he, what he's called were odd and meaningless acts. Okay. And so striking may those features be, that there are many instances on record in which the bodily trouble has been entirely overlooked and the child has been committed to an asylum. 125 years ago. I mean, it's time for some progress, isn't it? <laughs> okay? So what were the challenges in, what are the challenges that we've come across in, in the UK? The first thing is that um, the, many of the guidelines, the ones that were published in uh, JCAP, were very US based. And, there's no right or wrong in, in terms of who does what and in, in which country. It's just about culture and it's about the environment that you're in and actually providing treatment that's relevant uh, to your population and, and in the right context for your population. So when we had the US guidelines, uh, which were, were very good and very useful, we had to take those on and, and adapt them to something that was more relevant to the, um, the uh, population in the UK. Um, and that came through um, a, a process which I'll talk to you about a little bit later, which is where we had a parent, uh, a parent group which actually drove forward change um, to try and, um, try and ensure that we had protocols that were applicable to our, our population. The knowledge gap in uh, the medical profession was another problem. Um, I'll show you very, very shortly that a, a large percentage of people who actually came across Children with pads have never heard of it before, they've never heard of the condition. Parent groups can be a challenge. They can be, you can see them in a positive sense, but you can also see them in a negative sense. And the people that generally see them in a negative sense are those that feel threatened by them. And you've got to imagine, as a, if you're a parent and you go and see a doctor who's never heard of pads or pandas, and you, you actually are probably like a world expert on this topic, what, how does that doctor feel? You know, because that's, that's the reality. I have had so many conversations, mainly in the bar, actually, I've got to admit, but I've had lots of conversations with people, parents, who have told me so much about pans and pandas. You've become world experts on this condition because you've had to fight for your children, and I get that. But what we need to do is we need to be savvy, we need to be strategic about how we educate the medical profession to make sure that those patients that come in the future get the best treatment. Okay, so that's about us all working together. The political landscape is really important, um, and that's not just necessarily the political landscape when we are looking at a country, this is a political landscape in your units, or even in your um, region. So I have got colleagues who are very strong advocates for pounds and pounds, but they get beaten up on a daily basis by their, their own colleagues, because they, they don't believe in pounds and pounds. And you know, these guys have got mortgages to pay, they've got bills to pay, uh, they, they can't afford to lose their jobs. And so they have to manage their passion for this subject very, very delicately. And unfortunately, I think in some situations, it does impact on patient care. Um, and, but this is the reality, this is where we're at. And until we educate um, more of the medical profession, this is gonna be a continual problem. Economic factors. A lot of patients are, I think, misdiagnosed. Um, they're given labels of autism, or they're given a label, a label of a psychiatric disorder, um, and they are given support. But in the UK, that, that support is a blind alley. It leads nowhere. And you end up with a child who's got symptoms, who effectively is dropped from the care system, effectively. Now, if you looked at it, you, you could say, well, they, 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 they've been given support with CAM, so our child never has a mental health service. But the CAM service is so poor in the UK that actually it amounts to very little support. The lack of IVIG. So IVIG is something that we have talked about so much, um, but in the UK we, we, can't, we can't get it. Um, or it's very difficult to get at the very least. And that's because of a, what we officially call a shortage, but it's not a shortage at all. 
It's because our government isn't willing to pay the amount that the drug companies that make Divig uh, want them to pay. So they're not willing to pay the same amount that Divig is uh, costing in other countries. The result of that is that we have, uh, it's really difficult to, to actually access Ivy. Um, and you have to go through lots of committees, lots of hoops to actually get treatment. So we've had to adapt. But I think in this situation, we can say, I can say to you, let's not make it a negative, let's turn it around. Because actually the fact that we've had to deal with our Ivy means that we've had to treat our patients in different ways. Uh, and that may be, might be using steroid reverse or taper, long, long term taper steroid uh, courses. Um, and I think that because we've been forced into that situation, we have adapted and we're, we're trying to treat patients in the best way that we can. There's also a professional risk in treating a condition which is not recognised by your, um, your government, by your Department of Health, by the National Health Service. There's a risk there that you can be seen to be a complete lunatic who's running around doing alternative forms of treatment. And as parents and as professionals in other countries, it's really important that you kind of see that backdrop because um, it means that you have to be very careful in how you deliver your care. You have to make sure that you, you have the evidence of treatment and that you just don't go in blind, not, not just for yourself, but it's also safety for your patients. The really difficult things that we're dealing with at the moment, the probably the most difficult topic is safeguarding and um, child protection. Um, so as I, I've, I've been a pediatrician for 25 years, and when I, when I first went through my career, when we had difficult cases, uh, one of three things would happen. You'd give the child steroids, this is irrespective of the condition. You'd give the child steroids, you'd give them IVIC, or you'd, you'd take them into care. You know, one of those three things would happen. Because when a paediatrician comes across a case which they don't understand, they start to think, is it the child or is it the parent? And unfortunately, we've had several cases recently where children have been taken into care. Um, and we've, um, the uh, Ch uh, UK Panders Pounds Charity have been acting as advocates on their behalf and we're winning. Uh, we're hopefully getting those kids back into their parents' house fairly soon. But it has been a battle. And, and we heard, I think, yesterday from a parent who was uh, accused of the child's by proxy. This is a reality, and, that, and this is because um, we're, we're dealing with a condition that is not well known yet, and we need to raise the profile and keep educating and keep pushing. Okay, so what is pandas and panda and pandas? Well, yeah, where does it where does it sit? What speciality does it sit in? So the problem with pandas and pandas, from my perspective, is, is that it doesn't sit in one speciality. Yeah. It's a disorder which sometimes psychiatrists want ownership on, sometimes it's a neurologist, it might be an immunologist, or it might be a rheumatologist. Now the problem here is that when you, if you take a child with um, symptoms of OCD ticks and you know, etc, etc, and they go to see a neurologist, they're probably going to get an MRI scan and an EEG. If they go and see um, an immunologist, they're probably going to get their immune function checked out. And you can understand why that happens. Every speciality has their own kind of uh, view on what should be done to assess a child because it's what they do day in, day out. And their day to day practice affects how they approach uh, a child like this. So somehow we have to coordinate these different specialities because this disease covers across many different uh, boundaries. And what we need to do is get a psychiatrist to step into neurology and we need neurologists to step into psychiatry and the immunologists to step into paediatrics and the paediatrics to help coordinate the care. And I say that last bit because we've got established models where paediatricians have coordinated care already. For example, cerebral palsy. You know, they have multiple inputs from different specialities. The paediatrician just makes sure that everything is done. If we can get the right protocols together, this could be pretty easy, all right? What we need to do is make sure that the protocols we develop can be, first of all, digested in primary care, so that we get referrals quickly and we start treatment quickly, and secondly, that they're easily adapted in secondary care. Now, the reason I say that is because I think um, Kiki was absolutely right, this is the tip of the iceberg. And if we have a, a mass, uh, 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 massive patients coming through our health systems, with new diagnoses, and we try and push them all into tertiary care, it's going to get overloaded. It's just not going to work. 
And I think that actually, if we can, if we can make sure that when we develop the protocols, that we have the vision to ensure that there, there are some, there are elements of those protocols that can be implemented by primary and secondary care, then they can take the bulk of the workload. And hopefully, some of the figures that I'll show you will demonstrate that around about 60% of cases could easily be managed in primary care. Okay. So, 2018, um, I did a survey through the hospital where we, we talked to nearly 140 parents and we said, very simple question, when you first went to your GP, were they familiar with pandas and pandas? 90% said no, because there's a huge challenge there. That was a year ago. So last week I did the repeat um, survey and uh, got over 100 uh, responses. Um, it had improved by 3%. So, not a huge improvement, but it's a start. Um, and I think it's that kind of slow drag and it's something which is going to gain, gain momentum. Um, so, yeah, primary care certainly needs a lot of work doing. Okay, so let's talk about the journey um, for the development of the, uh, the paediatric protocol um, for Pans Pans in the UK and where we want to go. Because this is probably the most important part of the talk. In the audience, there's a young lady called Georgia. Georgia, where are you? There she is, at the back there, waving her hands. So, if you are, if you are part of a um, parent support group or you're developing a parent support group, you need to talk to this lady. Because Georgia is a, is a mother of a child with um, pants. And her energy in taking uh, the uh, parents' uh, charity forward was amazing. She can get you to do anything. This girl is manipulative, right? <laughs> she, she comes across as if, she, as if she's really nice, um, but then she'll make you do what she wants you to do. Um, but the, but the, the result of that is that she has uh, pushed forward her energy, and the, the parents around her have pushed forward um, the uh, Pallets Pandas agenda in the UK. And she rang me about two years ago and said, um, I hear that you that you've treated a child with, uh, with paddles. And I said, yeah, yeah. She said, I've got a couple of other parents who might have a problem. You know, would you be willing to, to talk to them? And I said, sure. So I had a conversation with one, um, one parent. The next thing I knew, that was it. So I, I was inundated. It's like the, the dam had burst. And uh, I don't know if any of you know Ming Lim, who uh, is a neurologist in London. I was driving down the, the motorway and, uh, uh, and Ming rang me and I pulled over into the services and we just started chatting about pandas and it, this is two years ago and he's, I said, what are we going to do? There's like hundreds of these patients, what are we going to do? We've got to do something and he said, yeah, I agree. So we met in London and uh, we met with some other physicians that Georgia orchestrated from major centres around the UK, like-minded people who just thought we've got to do something. So we had a combination of psychiatrists, we had neurologists, we had immunologists and we had paediatricians and most importantly the parents who had experience. And some of these parents had spent hundreds of thousands of pounds going to the US to get treatment. They'd sold their houses. I mean, it just wasn't acceptable. That situation is not acceptable. We wanted to get treatment for our children in the UK. So, um, so we very quickly got to work and within six to nine months we had our first treatment protocol um, published. And that is probably the most important step. If you're, going to do, if you're trying to change things in your own country, get a, get a protocol uh, developed quickly. Get a group of people, perhaps a small group, four to six individuals from major centres who have got influence, um, but who believe in pandas, and, and get that like-minded body of people can then generate the energy to take things forward. Um, and we based our first protocol on the US guidelines, slightly adapted. But as time went on, we changed it according to what we thought we needed. So, for example, we don't test Lyme now. Um, and I looked at 100, my first 100 patients that came through, um, they all got tested for Lyme uh, disease, and none of them were positive. So we stopped doing that. We've, uh, because we're not endemic. And we, so what we've done is adapt the protocols to what we need, and with time we'll adapt them further, we'll go on a 12-month cycle. My background is in paediatric oncology, and when I um, did, uh, when I was involved in oncology, we we took um, the studies we used were called the MRC um, um, uh, trials, and what they would do was look at data on a five-year five block. So, and by doing that, they they look at uh, treatments for for a condition, and five years later, they'd look at the data and they'd change the treatments accordingly. Um, and they took the survival rate for uh, survival rate for acute lymphoblastic leukemia 
from 10 to 15 percent to 99.9 percent, .9%, which is now completely survivable disease. And I think that kind of approach where you're looking at your data on a constant basis and you're reviewing things and making sure the treatments that you're giving is, a, is the correct treatment for your population is the right model. Having got the uh, protocol, we, uh, the next step is to engage with the Royal Colleges because they're the people that will accept pounds pandas as a disease, as a, as, a, as a clinical entity in our country. That's going to take time. That's going to take somewhere between two or three years at least to actually take it forward because it's a very slow process. Um, but at the same time, we're doing education events, we're trying to raise the profile through PR, and we're uh, trying to answer questions like, what is the incidence in our country? You know, is it one in 200 or is it different? And the way we're going to try and do that is by using surveillance studies. And also to get NHS clinics established. And the good news is, I think we're about a month or two away from the first NHS clinic for Pampers and Pampers in the UK. So um, hopefully that will that will be the first step to replicating what we need elsewhere in the country, and will help us get data as well. Then we want to we want to make sure that we get nice guidelines so that these are this condition is first of all recognised, but also that everybody knows exactly what to do, and we do it in a systematic way that's uniform. That will then allow us to get more data. The ultimate goal is that we get standardised care for our children, so that no matter who you are, where you're from, you get the right treatment. When we looked at the 2018 study, we um, also looked at how quickly were children given antibiotics because we've heard time and time again through the last couple of days that if you get good treatment, um, you need to get it quickly so that you minimise the symptoms of the child but also the response rate is going to be important for the eventual outcome. Unfortunately, when, when we looked at the data of 2018, you can see that a third of patients haven't got treatment after, after a year of symptoms. So we, we, need, to, we need to change that. The investigations that, that I do now, with all the patients that I, that I see, um, are kind of standard haematology, uh, kidney and liver function, ASOT, an anti-DNHB, mycoplasma titers, a CRP, which is very rarely raised, I've got to say, so it's probably not very, very useful, anti-nuclear antibodies, um, IgE, thyroid function, look at the immune system, and look at vitamin D. When we look at the symptom breakdown from the patients that we've seen, so over the past two, 18 months to two years, I've seen about 250 patients, and over the last year, there's been about 200. What I've, what I've realised very quickly is getting the right lab to do the analysis of your investigations is really important, um, and you need, to, you must, let, you must feel that you trust the data that comes out. And it's incredible the variability that you see around the country. So, I, so we managed to get data on nearly 100 patients with the same laboratory, the same process, to help us understand what was going on. And you can see with uh, some of the symptoms, um, and I think the figures seem to reflect what other people are seeing, OCD is about 85%, TICS is about 70%, urinary disturbance in 42%. Um, mesophonia hasn't been mentioned. So, and I thought I'd just mention this because this is really interesting. I kind of stumbled across this when one patient sort of started talking about the irritability her, ch her child has when she sat next to her and they're, and they're eating and she says, she makes them really anxious. And so this kind of mesophonia, sort of hyperacusis, distorted processing of sound thing, kind of uh, just kind of triggered something. And I thought, well, maybe I need to start asking about that. And I lived this only about a couple of months ago. And I think actually if we look for it, if we ask the question, it's probably more common than we think. And I was talking to Michelle about, um, because Michelle's an OT, as you, as you heard earlier on, and I was talking to her about the sound and sensory. She said nearly all of her patients have got a, a problem with sound processing. So I think we need to start asking the question about, you know, have you got a problem with um, sound processing? We'll find a way to understand that. And the reason that's important is because the patients I've seen with mesophonia and with OCD and tics, they tend, the OCD and tics tend to get uh, resolved very quickly, but the mesophonia takes a long time. It seems to lag behind for some reason. I don't know why. If someone can tell me, I'd be appreciated. So, doing these investigations, looking at these 100 patients, I've sort of, in my head, created a subtype group. And the reason that I'm doing this is because what I want to do is for us to then develop a protocol for each of the uh, comorbidities that we see with these patients. Okay, so, so if, you're, if you're a general practitioner and you get a child who's come, got, come in with OCD and tics, you think about um, allergy, because actually, 
you've got a, 20, a, a fifth of patients have got an allergic problem as, alongside the, alongside the uh, standard pants problems. Now, some of these patients have got more than just an allergy. So three patients uh, out of the 100 had IgE levels of 5,000. Okay, so then you're looking at some kind of immune problem here. So is this hyper IgE syndrome? Is, it, uh, uh, is this part of the autoimmune process? Whatever it is, this, this needs investigated by an immunologist, yeah? So, this, so th this opens the door for us to actually look at these patients in more detail. Um, but what I, was, what I want to do is, if we've got a protocol where we're saying to, pe to GPs start antibiotics, start with anti-inflammatories, if they've got an allergic uh, um, phenomena, start antihistamines. And there are patients that I've had where the antihistamine has had the biggest impact where the symptoms are resolved just with something as simple as satiricine. And I was, I was interested in one of the slides, I don't, know, I don't know whose slide it was, but in one of the, I think it was the Rituximab study, wasn't it, where you're adding um, satiricine as well? I, can't, I think. Well, we can talk about that later. Um, PANDAM is when we've got pa a PANDAS process with mycoplasma running alongside at the same time, and there are patients who seem to have both, and you need to make sure that you treat both. And then, of course, you've got your PAN symptoms and then the mixed group. So how long do we give antibiotics for? Well, as a paediatrician, my job is to make sure that the treatment that you get is safe and that when you treat your child, that we try and minimise toxicity. I've heard of patients being on treatment with antibiotics for three or four years. For me as a paediatrician, that makes me really uncomfortable. But at, at the same time, I understand that you as parents have got a child that's got symptoms that responds to this treatment. And I understand that we have to do something for those children. What I do now is, um, from a logical perspective, I have two weeks of antibiotic treatment and then four weeks of prophylaxis. And what I'm going to talk about later is why I get the four weeks of prophylaxis. Because I think I don't think we do what we I don't think what we're doing is using it as an antimicrobial. I think there's another effect here. Okay. So looking at these hundred patients that we had data on, how do they do? Well, 72% had a good response and 28% had some response. None got worse. Oh, by the way, I've got to say that this data was analysed by one of my, me my medical students, Georgia Innocent, who I've got to say thank you to, because it took hours to go through everything. But they're getting better, based on this, on this protocol. So, what's going on? So I, I, I've seen the, the amazing molecular work, um, and you know, I'm by myself, I haven't got a team of people around me, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, but. I've got a clinical model, and I just want to share it with you, and tell me what you think. So, in the brain, uh, in the basal ganglia, we've got the, the, the main areas that, that we've already discussed in terms of the caudate nucleus, the lentil nucleus, the amygdala, the claustrum, and then the insula. And these parts of the brain are really close together, yeah? And they talk to each other. There's communication going across all of these. You get a strep infection um, with the model that we're talking about, we get antibodies produced, and those cause inflammation um, or stimulation. And that's inflammation and stimulation because these parts of the brain are chatting to each other, spreads through the brain. And then you get your symptoms, which are OCDs, tics, misophonia, POTS, which we've spoken about. I had one patient who was having 200 drop attacks a day, starting on coma, and he was, and he was basically discharged by the tertiary centres. 200 drop attacks a day, and he gave great antibiotics, he came back to one or two uh, drop, drop, drop attacks per day. We, we give them antibiotics and anti inflammatories, and that down tunes the inflammation. Now, interesting paper by Tony Murphy looking at the psychotropic effects of antibiotics and other agents, where she says, you know, what's happening here is that the antibiotics are not just like antimicrobials. They're anti-inflammatories and they're also psychotropics. So you, when we give antibiotics, we've probably got three different things that we're doing at the same time. And it's really interesting looking at what the Karolinska could do, because I think you give six weeks of ibuprofen. Is that right? Yeah? Um, so you're giving an anti-inflammatory. Maybe what we're doing just by giving antibiotics is doing something very similar. But we could do what you're doing and we could give them anti-inflammatories just to help. Okay. So, so William Osler, what did he say? So striking may this features be that there may be instances of record where the bodily trouble has been entirely overlooked and the patient to be committed to an asylum. So let's convert that to what, what we would say today. 
And what I would say is that there are many cases where we have ignored a physical explanation for a child's symptoms because we've been too ready to diagnose them with autism or psychiatric disease. Thank you. study that they see how important this is because we can't do it in the, in the UK at the moment based on the data that we've got available. If however there was a randomised control study and that proved that I was useful, then that would change in the UK. Yeah? At the moment parents are struggling because they see people in other countries getting treatment and if they are, are, are wanting treatment they, they're, they're having to come across a lot of uh, obstacles that they need to jump over. It's really tough for them, yeah. But as you said, you're, you're trying to turn into something positive, you are trying to find other treatments. Yeah, yeah. And uh, well, you were talking about, you, you are working very close with parents, parents' organizations, yeah. pa patients' organizations, yeah. very, very yeah. Uh, important here. Can you say, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? Yeah, so with the, with the Children's in Hospital model, um, I believe that parents and children are the customers, and that they should be the people that design the service. So we have a parent steering committee that does exactly that. They tell us how they want to do it. And then we've, offered, we've got the UK Panders Pans uh, charity group, we, who are specifically Pans and Panders, have been instrumental in how we do things. And how we, and, and it's an open forum. We do not have any closed doors between parents and doctors on our group. If we talk to each other. We are, we're one group, we're one team. Are you actually having online uh, discussions or something like that? For no, the parents group? Yeah, uh, the parents. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, when we, we, we have done, but we normally actually meet in one centre. So we've got different parts of the country where we know that there's a problem in terms of service provision. And what Georgia and her team have done is to take us to those places so that we actually meet the local physicians, we talk to them about it, we introduce the protocol, and actually we give them a bit of support because if you're a doctor in um, you know, the outskirts of Scotland and you've got a child with pans pan symptoms but you've never treated them before, you need to have that professional support in order to go take that forward. Without it, you, you're, you, know, you put yourself at a lot of risk. Yeah, but no e-consultation then? Not for those, but I do e-consultations for most of my patients. Okay. But there is a facility face-to-face -face as well. Yeah. That's fantastic. I just wish you luck and uh, well, really good luck and keep up the good work. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.